I guess it was 12 years ago I was uh, sitting out there um, just before my first semester teaching here, term, I suppose you call them, um, wide-eyed and a bit naive, uh, un unlike all of you who look very grounded and down to earth. <laughs> I'm no longer wide-eyed, I have two young kids and that means I'm mostly just sleepy. <laughs> but I remember those days uh, with, with a great deal of fondness and I certainly want to thank uh, Courtney Ross for bringing me back here. Uh, it's a, a privilege, uh, privilege and a pleasure to stand here in front of you and talk a little bit about things I don't really know. I also want to thank Bill and Ralph. I spent only a year here teaching, but uh, the time was formative for me. And the things I learned, uh, not only through, through their tuition, but also the help of um, all of my colleagues here at Ross, have really carried on into my own teaching. And it's something that's helped shape not only the way I approach anthropology, but the way I approach teaching and educating my students. With that in mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about human evolution and sustainability. And I've added this grandiose subheading from Homo sapiens to Homo sustenens. As the film told us, Homo sapiens means something on the order of, you know, a human who knows. We do know an awful lot. We need to transition to humans who sustain, or if we come up with a better word, maintain, persevere. We need to apply our knowledge not to ourselves, not just to our offspring, not to ensure the survival of our offspring, but our offspring's friends, relatives, colleagues. And in fact, the next generation and generations to come around the world. I didn't coin the phrase homo sustenens. Uh, an economist from Germany came up with this uh, several years ago, I think, thinking along the same lines that the direction we're headed is not a good direction. There is cause for an alarm. There is cause for rejoicing and there's cause for appreciating the beauty like we saw in those paintings. That is our heritage. We also have a heritage of unsustainable behavior. Something which I know very little about, uh, my, my own behavior aside. My research interests actually diverged quite a bit from um, modern human behavior and culture. Uh, as, as Dave said, I have two main focus to my research. One of them is working uh, at fossil sites in Kenya. Here you see this lovely remnant of a volcano. As we heard earlier this morning, my esteemed colleague talk about the aridification of Africa over time. Part of this has to do with the rifting. There's a whole series of rift valleys in Eastern and Central Africa. And as a result, you get lots of volcanic activity, lots of erosional surfaces. This makes it a wonderful, wonderful spot for finding fossils. So I work, I've worked primarily here on Rusinga Island which is a 20 million year old fossil ape site. Some of the earliest fossil apes, some of the best preserved fossil apes were found in this site by Lewis Leakey, Mary Leakey and their colleagues, including this lovely skull of proconsul. The other side of my research is, is much more laboratory based and if you can imagine that 500 million points characterizing every nook and cranny of that cave it's exactly the sort of thing we're trying to do to characterize every nook and cranny of cranial anatomy. And my interests are in cranial morphogenesis. What are the factors that go into producing different shapes of the cranium? How does that inform us about our evolutionary history? Can we take rigorous statistical models from biology, apply them to a well-quantified cranium to produce evolutionary changes like so? And none of this prepares me very well to talk about sustainability. <laughs> Fortunately for all of us, uh, my colleague gave the story of human evolution earlier in a way that I could not have done. Who better than Professor Yves Copens? 
What I'd like to do then is talk a little bit about how my research has articulated with ideas of human sustainability. And perhaps end with some ideas about how we can uh, implement some of this in the classroom. So, the teacher in me thinks that we should start with a quiz. <laughs> there were five responses to eridification that we heard about earlier this morning. Does anybody remember them? We've got a robust Australopithecus gari up in Ethiopia. We've got robust Paranthropus boisei in Kenya and Ethiopia. We've got robust Paranthropus robustus down in South Africa. We've got a less robust, uh, probably, lineage of Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus sediba down in South Africa. All of them small-brained. And at Olduvai Gorge, we have something new, something different, something with a much larger brain. Adapting to the same sorts of conditions in a different and a unique way. And it's through studying Olduvai Gorge that I first came into contact with, with ideas about sustainability and some of the problems therein. This is a picture here of Olduvai. You can see Lemmergrut in the background, again, conducive to fossilization when you've got lots of volcanic ash spitting out all over the place. Laetoli is over off here outside the picture where we have the famous Australopithecus footprints. And if you excavate at Olduvai Gorge, you can find lots of cool things like this. A little hard to see, but a massive rhinoceros, a whole series of large bovids. And we can reconstruct the landscape to look like this. These reconstructions always sort of look a bit, uh, a bit ad hoc. You know, we found all of them here. Let's, let's put them all together. <laughs> Fair enough. probably more accurate than you think. Not that they all would have been there on the same day at the same time, although let's be honest, in the evening everyone goes down to the water to drink. My colleagues and I were interested in trying to understand what sort of ecology would permit the evolution of a larger sized, larger brained hominin. There are lots of different ways to approach ecology, and the approach we were interested in was looking at the mammalian community. So if we look at the sorts of animals here that have been found at Olduvai, do they seem to represent a dense forest habitat? Do we see a lot of forest creatures? Is it more of an open woodland? Is it a, a super open savanna? So we can look at mammalian community structure to try to understand this environment that apparently allowed our ancestors to develop large brains. Without getting into the details of the analysis too much, what you're looking at is a multi-dimensional analysis of, of, of different paleoecological characters of the different fossil animals. So you start tallying up how many herbivores, are they big herbivores, are they small herbivores, how many are running on four legs, how many of them are climbing up in trees. All these ecological variables. And if you run an ordination like this, this is a correspondence analysis, what you find is that all of your forest communities cluster together on one side because their mammal communities are distinct. This is surprisingly easy to interpret, right? This is a minimal publishable unit. Right? Just publish it. Don't think about your data. If you think about your data, you run into trouble. People have been saying arid community at Old Divide before precisely for this reason. But if you actually look at the body mass profiles of all the fossils you find at Olduvai, what you find is something like this. I've got it divided up into two different beds. These are two different distinct layers. This is not uncommon. We find lots of big things because big, big things preserve well. We don't find many little things because either they don't preserve or, to be honest, some people just don't like picking up little things. But this is extraordinary. In lower bed two, we have one of the best small mammal faunas anywhere in East Africa. We also have quite a tremendous representation of large mammals. Now, we're going to compare these, as I just showed you from the ordination plot, we're going to compare these to all of these other 
community profiles. What you find is a modern forest profile looks like this. A modern woodland profile looks like this. A mosaic and an open habitat. Not one of them has the representation of large mammals that we see at Old Dubai. Not one of them. Habitats sampled around the world None of them preserves the same sort of large mammal community that we had back in the Pleistocene. Now, I can account for that statistically. It's the only reason I'm on this project. Right. We can simulate that, we can do lots of uh, re replicates, and we can conclude that Old Dubai is actually probably more wo wooded than we thought. That's not the point of my talk here. In fact, there no longer exists on this planet a mammalian community comparable to those inhabited by the earliest members of our genus. Nowhere in the world can I find a mammal community that I can actually make a reasonable statistical comparison. Now we all know about Pleistocene megafaunal extinction, right? <laughs> Lots of big things died out in the, the late Pleistocene. I knew about that. It never occurred to me that it happened to all of them everywhere. That it wasn't just places in North America that lost the rhinoceros or the aurochs. That it was a fundamental change in the mammalian communities around the world brought on at the end of the Pleistocene by factors we can argue about. And we do. This is what we do in paleoanthropology. Traditionally, this was because humans migrate to a place and they start to kill big things. This was long accepted as dogmatic. And as typically happens in science, when we have dogma, we eventually get people who need to argue against it. And so on one hand, we have people arguing that as modern humans migrate around the world, as they get into Eurasia, eventually into Australia, as they come into the New World, they're killing off through hunting or through altering the landscape, through subsistence farming or even pastoralism, somehow killing off all of the large mammals. Alternatively, people have been arguing that it's actually just a result of climate change that as we leave the Pleistocene and we put all of that glaciation behind us, until it comes back again, but we won't talk about that, as the temperatures and the climate changes around the world, these megafauna simply go extinct because they're losing their habitats. This is a current argument. People still arguing one way or the other, back and forth in the literature. But I think we're now past the point where simple climate change is a reasonable explanation for large mammal extinction around the world. That we've gotten to the point where we're no longer arguing, did humans cause mammal extinction in the Pleistocene, but simply, how much did they contribute? Was it only 50%? Was it more than 50%? I don't have time to get into the literature behind these debates, and it's quite substantial. But let me give you a few examples. Australia, here you're looking at fossil burial, actually deliberately buried. There are floral remains with this burial from Lake Mungo, dating perhaps 40 to 50,000 years old and a representation of some of the fascinating large vertebrates that live there until just after humans arrived. If you look at the most recent research, Rule et al. in science two years ago looked at high resolution climate data over 130,000 years. And they showed what I think pretty conclusively 
that it's human migration to Australia that causes the loss of the endemic megafauna, including large grazing mammals. What happens when you have no large grazing mammals? The entire floral landscape changes. And so we then see the rainforest getting replaced by sclerophyll grasslands. Madagascar. If you're interested in primates, Madagascar is a fascinating place, known for lots of different kinds of lemurs. I am told that if you want to see them, get there soon. As recent as 500 years ago, we also had gorilla-sized lemurs. A whole diversity of massive lemurs. We're talking about the flat face in human evolution, we have flat faced lemurs, probably eating bamboo, showing parallel adaptations to our human ancestors, probably for the same functional reasons. There's a whole story here about changing in body size and the evolutionary implications and the ecological implications of getting bigger and smaller. Dying out in successive waves that seem to correspond to successive colonizations of Madagascar. If we go to the New World, Johnson et al. last year concluded that the megafauna in the New World, looking at sites in both North and South America, go extinct approximately one to 2,000 years after the arrival of humans. There's a pretty clear pattern when humans get to a locality, they coexist for one to 2,000 years before we lose the megafauna. We can put all of this together, and by we I mean much smarter people who can model this sort of thing. And look, worldwide, more than 220 countries assessed for their human biogeography. When did humans arrive? What did the climate look like before, during, and after human arrival? And how does that correspond to extinction events? What Sandem et al. found uh, just a few weeks ago, published, is that extinction is strongly tied to human migration and climate, at best, shows a weak correlation in Eurasia. This is not the end of the debate, and I don't want to represent this as something that we've all solved. There's no more to be said. But as I indicated earlier, even those really pushing the climate side of this argument are now starting to model it as how much was it climate and how much of it was human intervention. There's a fascinating paper published in 2010 that actually argues that humans have a prior history of global warming, at least maybe we should call it regional warming, that their impact on the flora in Pleistocene Beringia <coughs> cause an indirect impact on the, on, on the, sorry, their impact on the fauna cause an indirect impact on the flora, which could have resulted to local climate shifts up to one degree Celsius. May not seem like much, but in fact, an average change of one degree Celsius is a substantial change for any biota uh, to subsist through. turned into kind of a downer. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> As Mrs. Ross said uh, at the beginning of the day, there's no doubt that we can overcome this. It's just a matter of taking the effort to do it. But this is not about human technology. This is not about us inventing more and better tools and thereby killing off our landscape. Yes, we, we do that. These are the tools of unsustainability in the late Pleistocene. This is what was killing the megafauna. It was not my laptop. So we need to think not just about where are we headed, what, what, what directions that our culture is going are going to lead us out of or deeper into 
unsustainable behavior. We need to think, what about humanity leads us to these sorts of behaviors? Which begs the question, why are we so destructive? I could simplify that. What's a modern human? We got 12 grades here aimed at answering that question. What's a modern human? I'm soliciting answers now. Greedy. Hmm? Greedy. Greedy. I could argue that for most animals, I think. Certainly my dog. We heard lots of examples this morning. A habitual biped, large brains. We have small canines. We're not very sexually dimorphic. Some more than others. <laughs> we can put together a laundry list of these things. I kind of separate these out into things that I would study and things that don't preserve in the fossil record. Lots of anatomical features that make us unique. I didn't include things like having a chin. I did include incredible amounts of sweat glands. We are a sweaty species. <laughs> Going against the aquatic ape hypothesis. But we're also self-conscious. We're capable of abstract thought. We have a perception of time. We can place ourselves in that time. We have complex language, we have complex tools. We're neotenous, we take a long time to grow up. What I want to do then is take a life history perspective on how we are unique as a species and how that may play into the sorts of cultures that lead us to unsustainable behaviors. When I talk about life history, what I'm really talking about is the timing of various important events in one's life, and in particular, the evolution of that timing. And so we can think about uh, things such as giving birth, weaning, age of menarche, how long is your interbirth interval, at what age are you no longer capable of reproducing. The timing of these events actually varies quite radically between us and our closest relatives. Perhaps it's something in our life history that leads to the sorts of culture we have, the incredible, beautiful things that we are capable of, as well as the darker side of those behaviors. And when we compare ourselves to most other mammals, humans have a dramatically retarded life history schedule. We do things much more slowly from birth until death than almost all other mammals. To give you an example, here's a baby capuchin. If you've seen any, any film that references monkeys from Africa, they usually use this South American monkey. <laughs> it takes about seven years for a female capuchin, on average, to reproduce. That's an example of life history, about seven years. Chimpanzee. Our closest extant relative on this planet takes about 12 years. A much more extended growth and development. Modern human, 18 years. Biologically speaking, what we've done with this culturally is mind boggling. Biologically speaking, we can consider ourselves sexually mature at 18 years old. That means your third molars have erupted. Why? In fact, we don't know, and I'm gonna give you some examples of what we do know from the fossil record, but we're gonna come back to why and still not have an answer. Another thing to roll into this is the idea of heterochrony. And heterochrony simply means different clocks for your development. The timing of your development differs from something else. 
And so, as I said, humans have an extended development. And you would think that would predict paramorphic morphology. In other words, you would think if we take longer to grow up, we would grow up, let's just say, even more. We'd be a bigger, badder version <laughs> of what we would be otherwise. And that's exactly the opposite of what we see. Humans are not paramorphic, we're pedomorphic. We have juvenilized features. You can see it very clearly in this 1917 publication from Darcy Thompson, which is a beautiful read. Highly recommend it. This is a chimpanzee going through a series of hand-drawn transformation grids. Look at that. Albert Durer did this in 1555. What you see here, the chimpanzee in its juvenile stage looks remarkably like the human in its adult stage. We retain this juvenile, these juvenile characteristics. And that would seem to go against this idea that we're actually taking a lot longer to grow up. What that means, in fact, is we have no idea how these things came about in an evolutionary sense. We don't know why we take so long to grow up. And we have no idea how we have slotted in that time, the changes in our evolutionary morphology. And so what interests me is what is the evolutionary development of human life history? How do these things come to be manifest the way they are in modern humans? So just to give you an idea of uh, who we're talking about here, you've heard lots of these names already. Starting back 700, uh, 7 million years ago with Sahelanthropus chadensis, which we heard about earlier this morning, some of the other early hominins. We have very scrappy material. It's also very recently discovered, and so we're, uh, we, scientists are still doing research. We have a lot more information about some of these things that were discovered later, particularly the ones that are better represented. So I want to focus particularly on the genus Australopithecus. The famous Lucy discovery was a member of a species of Australopithecus. Something that seems to predate or precede, let's say, the expansion of the human brain, which we attribute to the genus Homo. And in the genus Homo, I want to talk about Homo erectus. We could roll it into ergaster, and then Neanderthals. I don't want to represent this in a linear way, but in fact, we have a linear trajectory that weaves its way through this tree all the way back to its connection with the last common ancestor. But we can go even further back. We can go to that last common ancestor and find that, you know, compared to most mammals, chimpanzees have a delayed life history, have an extended growth and development period for reasons we don't fully understand. And so let me take you back 20 million years to Rusinga Island my colleagues and I started digging here in 2006, building on uh, some phenomenal work done by Alan Walker, Mark Tieford, Martin Pickford, and the Leakeys before that. And what we're doing on Rusinga is we're searching the very base of this tree of apes and humans. We're looking down at the bottom to see what are the earliest features that seem to define us as a group. Back in the 80s, uh, Chris Dean from UCL was able to take one of these proconsul teeth, proconsul is the fossil ape we find here, take one of those teeth, section it histologically, and believe it or not, in teeth you can actually count enamel prisms like you would count tree rings and estimate the age of the individual when it died. And what Chris Dean showed us was that even at the base of this tree, one of the earliest fossil apes we know, we had already started evolving this life history, this extended development time. Not as extended as modern humans, not as extended even as a chimpanzee, but different than old world and new world monkeys. What we didn't know, what's the ecological context that allows this to happen? And at the time, most research suggested that Rusinga Island was actually an open grassland. 
isotope analyses of the fossil soils predicted that this would have been an open grassland. And that doesn't fit very well with the slowing down of life history. In fact, the best models predict that slower life histories happen in very protected environments, more likely in a dense forest. And what we discovered here in 2011 was exactly that. And if you look carefully, all over this landscape, you can see fossil tree trunks. Yeah? No? I've tripped on these things so many times I had no idea what they were. So one of my geologists said, hey, these are tree trunks. I said, no, no, no. These are tree trunks. I've seen these before. They're tree trunks. Okay, they're tree trunks. No one's going to believe you. It's a big deal to find tree trunks. So we brushed off the surface. And exiting every one of these tree trunks was a series of roots, fossilized, branching out. Across the landscape, all in a single layer. Not eroding down the hill, so we don't know where they came from, but a single, pristine layer. 37 tree trunks, different diameters. 800 fossil leaves. And Lord help me, proconsul sitting right in front of a tree trunk. A little baby proconsul. Looks like it just fell out of the tree. That's sad, I know. But. <laughs> Four fossil teeth. And what this means is we can now specifically locate not only proconsul, but this evolutionary advancement, this extended life history in a very dense, closely packed canopied forest. And in fact, modern forestry techniques allow us to predict the size of the forest, whether it's a single canopy, a multi-canopy, and even re re reproduce what it might have looked like. This suggests that our life history at least got its start, not on an open savanna, not in a woodland, but in fact in a densely packed forest 18 to 20 million years ago. Let's move up into, into hominins, something much more closer to our lineage. One of the first fossil hominins ever published from Africa, the first, was the Tong child from South Africa. And from those caves in South Africa, uh, near where the Tong child was found, we have uh, dozens and dozens of fantastic fossil crania. And this allows us to do some interesting things. And again, Chris Dean was able to section some of these teeth and estimate the age of these individuals and show that even at this point in our evolutionary history, we're still growing up at the rate of a chimpanzee. We're well onto the human lineage. Seven to 10 million years ago, as we heard this morning, we've diverged from that common ancestor. But as late as three million years ago, we're still growing and developing like a chimpanzee. What they could not show, and what we were finally able to show in my lab, again, using those multivariate statistical models, was that while the timing of our teeth might still be like a chimpanzee. If you look at the fossils and where they cluster, they're actually starting to look much more like a human. And thus, at this point in our evolutionary history, we've already diverged, we've already split out the timing of our dental development and the way that our face and, and the rest of our cranium develops, suggesting a real disconnect that there are multiple factors that are going to explain, ultimately, the life history in modern humans. Homo erectus. Here's something with a larger brain. We put it in the genus Homo for a reason. Much more like us than something like Australopithecus. But surprisingly, dental development still shows that it's growing up at the rate of a chimpanzee. 
we all thought that it was our large brains that required us to grow up so slowly. But the brain's getting bigger, and the timing's not changing. What did happen in Homo erectus is we started extending the lifespan at the other end. In Homo erectus, we start to find individuals who are well past their breeding age, male or female, who in fact have lost most of their teeth long enough that the bone started to resorb, like you see here, suggesting they probably did not have the capacity to survive in the landscape they were living in, which indicates a degree of human cooperation. In fact, I can think of nothing more utterly human than caring for our elderly. A man is a man when he's a man. We start to see this in Homo erectus. And what that means is that now you have not just mom caring for the offspring. If we've developed monogamy, we also have dad caring for the offspring. And now we're starting to get grandma and grandpa caring for the offspring. That's a tremendous inflow of resources that we don't see in other animals. Neanderthals are the next stop. And we know that Neanderthals, on average, have larger brains than we do, on average. Surely, they will have a much more extended life history to create that massive glob in the cranium. In fact, no. This, to me, is one of the most astonishing things that has come out of our discipline in the last 10 years. Even the large-brained Neanderthals are growing up quickly and dying fairly young. And that means that it's not simply having a large brain that requires us to extend our development. As we saw in the film, as we heard earlier this morning, we are not Neanderthals. We're something substantively, maybe even radically different. We could share genes with them, and that's something we still don't understand. How you share genes between something that takes 13 years to grow up versus 18 years to grow up. But we know it happened, some models aside. But they'd never, as far as we know, developed the sophistication, the culture, that modern humans had long before we have the Neanderthals in the fossil record. In other words, modern humans have radically altered the developmental timing compared to even our closest fossil hominin uh, relatives. That we are doing something fundamentally different. My colleague Ian Tattersall, when I was still a grad student, uh, said to me, Neanderthals are the end point of what you can do with a bigger and bigger brain. That you keep growing that thing up, you eventually get to Neanderthals. Humans are something else. Modern humans are something different. So, what does this have to do with sustainability? I'm not entirely sure, but I think that the Ross curriculum is a great place to explore that. As modern humans, we have millions of years of selection in our lineage favoring increased care for our offspring. Going all the way back to mammals with mothers increasing their energy output to care for their offspring. Once we get monogamy or pseudo-monogamy in the human lineage, we also have fathers caring for their offspring. We have evolutionary motivation for making sure our offspring grow up and reproduce. Add to that in Homo erectus, an elderly class, which means we have multiple generations contributing to the well-being of those offspring, increasing their own fitness thereby. And suddenly in modern humans, 
you have a radically slower life history, which means all of that input, all of those resources, all of that help continues longer and longer and longer. It also means you have an extended childhood, something we see in no other animal, a real childhood, which allows us to learn, which allows us to take those resources and do something with it. Not just mimic our parents like a bird, but in fact, build on that, create from that. And it's this, I think, that facilitates the explosion and the evolution of human culture. But the implications of that, we have an ongoing biological imperative to provide for our offspring, but we answer that in terms of cultural economies. We don't answer with our biology. We answer with our culture. Any of you who have kids, when they get sick, you take them to the doctor. You don't let natural selection do its <laughs> horrible thing. And sadly, the greatest evolutionary psychologists are the people in the advertising agencies. Right? They can winnow us down to the very basis of those biological urges and somehow connect it to something we absolutely don't need. I have a good friend in, in Kenya who's a subsistence farmer, one of the smartest people I've met, who told me last year that he thinks he needs a laptop for subsistence farming. This is advertising. These are billboards he's seeing, messages he's getting on his mobile. We have these biological needs, these biological imperatives, but we do not answer them with biology. And to me, over its long period of extended development, this is what leads us to unsustainable behavior. Outcompeting our closest competitors, and let's be clear, our closest competitors are always in the same species because we share the same niche. Outcompeting our competitors turns into keeping up with the Joneses. We can see a simple example of this, actually. If you just look at uh, changes in birth rates versus death rates over time. And so we know, for example, as modern medicine, modern nutrition get into different parts of the world, the death rates go way down. And so life history strategies whereby Couples were having six, seven, eight offspring, hoping, hoping that two would survive to reproduce. These strategies become irrelevant once this death rate goes way down. And yet, it keeps happening. The biological imperative, answered by the culture of medicine, puts us at a disconnect that then leads to massive population growth. And do you know what the single factor that brings this down is? The single factor. There is only one significant factor that explains why eventually the birth rate comes down. Any ideas? Close. Education of women. The better we educate women, the closer we follow in our culture what biology is already doing. And thus, I actually believe that education can be, I'll put it in quotes, a speciation event, taking us from what we have become through the late Pleistocene into the Holocene, if we want to call it the Anthropocene, I don't like that, and turning us into something else something sustainable, something that will persist. When I think about education, it brings me, I always think about this scene from uh, one of the Chronicles of Narnia. I've got, I'm reading these to my kids. I'd forgotten this. There's a scene where, uh, most of you know Narnia. If you don't, 
kids from this world that go to a fantasy world. It's a hernia, it's great. There's a scene in The Magician's Nephew where they're talking about the creation of Narnia, the very beginning. I won't get into all of the details, but <coughs> things are sprouting out from everywhere, and it turns out anything you plant will grow. A piece of an iron lantern thrown into the ground turns into an iron lantern tree. A piece of toffee, candy, turns into a toffee candy tree. We find out later that this is only good for a few days. The magic doesn't last. C.S. Lewis, of course, was using this as a metaphor for something else, but is this not the perfect metaphor for the mind of a child? Where we can plant, and what we plant bears fruit. Not forever, but we have a window of time where we can actually affect change. Let me talk about a couple difficulties. There's lots. These are things that I've come up with when I talk about sustainability and the, the few venues I get to do that in the university. We used to teach a class called Futuristics where we, think, where we used to think about the future. One of the greatest difficulties I had in talking to the kids was getting them past this idea of an ecological footprint. Last time I taught the class, the American ecological footprint was something like 70 times the size of an African ecological footprint, and about five times the size of a European ecological footprint. This is a very com compelling image, right? The idea that this is the stamp you leave on the earth, the ecological footprint. The problem with this is that it conveys a single location Footprint means that it's here, that all of the impact is here. And so I would ask the kids, well, is it okay? Is it okay for you to have as many children as you want? And the answer invariably is, as long as I can support them. It's a fair answer. What kids do not understand, and what I think is gonna be the real difficulty and transitioning to a sustainable human species through education. It's trying to get kids to understand a complex system of world economic relationships, trade relationships, political relationships, where my ecological feet are not imprinting here, but they're walking on the backs of subsistence laborers around the world. That I can go to a Minneapolis supermarket and I can trace food there back to my friend on Rusinga Island in Kenya, where he is part of that economy that is bringing that food to Minneapolis, thereby keeping him and everyone in that community in a place of low wages, no benefits, where one bad rainy season can wipe out your family. And it's that complex system that kids cannot or have not been taught to understand. And so these webs of relationships don't follow simple causal chains, at least not the ones we're taught in school. We don't teach students to understand systems. And I know we're gonna hear more about that tomorrow. So what is the value of teaching human evolution? at least with regard to sustainability, I could go on and on. But a couple of thoughts. Human complex cultural systems have evolved. We can actually look way back in the Pleistocene and find much more simple systems. We have obsidian on Rusinga Island that we can source to the Rift Valley. We know exactly where it came from. It's a very simple system. These simple cause and effect models trace through a thread in the curriculum can then be broadened out into complex system in a way that I think kids can grasp. That if we show not just complexity, but the evolution of complexity, that we can really hit home how the world is interconnected. 
Another value, the overthrow of biological evolution by cultural evolution has placed us in a world in which many of our biological drives are overstated or unnecessary. Our biology has not recognized that. We still act and react to the imperative shaped over millions of years. And if we explain these concepts as part of a curriculum that talks about the evolution of humans, then we can much better understand the motivations in our own lives, in our societies, and in our world culture. And finally, as I've shown you, we can look at human impact prehistorically. We can show the Adel Adel and the Lavalois tool points and say, look what they could do with that. Imagine what we can do now. That's a picture we can paint. Thank you.